Uh, the mainstream axioms regarding evidence for non cosmological redshifts. Axiom number one, all objects follow Hubble's law. Axiom number two, all objects have modest deviations from Hubble's law, follow Hubble's law. <laughs> Axiom number three, all objects that violate Hubble's law, follow Hubble's law. <laughs> His uh, point, uh, their point is they would say, number two, they say, well, it's just peculiar motions. Number three, they say you know, statistical chance alignments of foreground and background objects would explain the really big deviations. So they would basically just deny that there could be any cases of uh, actual deviations from Hubble's law. So establishing some kind of evidence requires more than just the statistics of chance alignments. For example, if you find evidence for interaction between two objects with very different redshifts, we can find evidence for a much higher redshift object superposed in front of a lower redshift object, or just applying redshift independent distance indicators. Well, the strongest forms of interaction between two objects are bridges. Right, and for example, Zwicky in 1954 recognized this. He stated, these connecting links of intergalactic matter provide the first reliable criterion for whether two, three, or more galaxies are located at the same distance. It's been a very well accepted criteria for interaction. This galaxy uh, on the upper right here, you can see that there is a bridge connecting it uh, to the smaller companion. Sometimes you see these bridges in radio waves, such as this uh, lower here, the hydrogen is measured. You can see there is a bridge connecting the two clumps of the galaxy, if you will. Uh, this was studied uh, through simulations by Tumor and Tumor in 1972. So it's the standard mainstream criteria for interaction. Now, uh, obviously, if you uh, look at non-gravitational causes, you would still expect bridges. If you look at plasma processes or uh, ejection processes, you would still expect there to be a bridge connecting. So no matter who you are, you would expect bridges mean interaction. Uh, so then we have this very famous example, NGC 7603. And you can see uh, the redshifts are given in Z values, so they're not multiplied by the speed of light. NG7603 has a redshift of about 8,000 kilometers per second. Its companion, a little over 16,000, so there's roughly 8,000 kilometers per second difference in redshift. Um, mainstream still likes to say in this case, well, it's a chance alignment. But one of the things that everyone needs to be aware of in this example is if NGC7603b, which is object one, is not the cause of that bridge, then what is? Where is the object that drew up that bridge? That clearly, that filament is clearly being pulled out by something. The mainstream says, well, it's got to be something else. All right, I don't know what that something else is. Uh, adding further interest to this system, in 2002, it was found there were two H2 galaxies, which are very similar to quasars, uh, in that filament. that marks as objects two and three in this diagram on the right. Uh, again, supporting ARP's ideas of high redshift objects being located with uh, low redshift objects. Here's another example on the left. This is one that hasn't been published as a uh, discordant redshift system. But uh, if you look at the two redshifts, the smaller companion has a redshift about 2,400 kilometers per second, larger than the higher redshift companion. You hopefully you can see that filament reaching upward towards the top. Let me highlight it right now, you can see it later. That filament right there connecting that. Uh, this is an interesting difference in redshift because at 2,400 kilometers per second, it's only about a thousand more than the standard peculiar motions that are accepted in clusters, and yet it's still pretty large. It'd be pretty unusual. So this is this one kind of traps the mainstream researcher. You know, can we come up with an interaction explanation that can explain a high orbital motion, or do we just say it's a chance background? Uh, notice that it's very similar in appearance to the one on the right. There's a very small difference in redshift, so this one on the right would automatically be accepted because of the close redshifts as an interactive compare. You get an idea of just how strong the interaction or the bridge evidence is considered for interaction. Here we have a galaxy, you know, it's a tadpole galaxy. You can see the filament, uh, which in my view, probably more like a plasma process causing this, but there's a filament that ends with nothing. All right, so mainstream researchers came up with this idea. something I once told Art in an email, that the cycle cannot be disproven, it can only be proven. That seems to be uh, a way to go with that. But you know, in, in other words, the, the, the inconsistency here, they're proposing dark matter galaxies where you can't see anything, and yet in the previous example with NGC 7603, you see the companion there because of the redshift, they automatically dismiss it. So this is kind of what we're dealing with. Here's a great example. Uh, this is NGC 1275. The uh, central elliptical galaxy has a redshift of 5,200 kilometers per second. 
superposed clearly in front of it. We can't dispute this distance relationship at all. Uh, is it 8,200 kilometers per second broken up galaxy? There's no question in this case the foreground galaxy has a 3,000 kilometers per second higher redshift. However, uh, having redshift dependent distances would make a big difference. These are some of the techniques astronomers use. My own research deals with the Tully Fisher relation, but some of these others are very relevant to exploring this. And I got into the Tully Fisher relation for this reason. A lot of ARPs work about spiral galaxies. And he said they have small excess intrinsic redshifts. So my idea was well, if that's the case, if we get good Tully Fisher distances, we have to see that they don't tightly follow a standard Hubble law. There should be some deviation, which that early figure in this presentation shows that that is in fact the case. So I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, let's give you a couple other examples from the literature. Lucy, in 1986, studied the Centaurus cluster. It's known for a bimodal redshift distribution. What that means is, as you see on the graph on the bottom, there are two peaks in the redshift distribution. They broke the sample down into two subclusters, the 730 cluster, centered around NGC 4696, a massive elliptical galaxy, has an average redshift of around 3,000 kilometers per second. The 745 sample, centered around NGC 4709, has a redshift of about 4,500 kilometers per second. So according to the Hubble law, there should be about a 20 megaparsec distance difference between these two subgroups. In other words, the standard interpretation would be that the 730 cluster is sitting in front of the 745 cluster. They're just kind of pointing at us lined up. Uh, however, when one thing that Lucy noted was based on the diameters of all the galaxies in both samples, they concluded they might actually be at the same distance. This is confirmed using the surface brightness fluctuation method. NGC 4696 is at 34.5 megaparsecs, NGC 4709 at 34.4 megaparsecs. So they're not separated by their Hubble distances, they're actually at the same distance. And notice the huge excess redshift again that we have, it's over 2,500 kilometers per second for NGC 4709. I asked Mark about this particular cluster once, he said he didn't know what was going on there. He was struggling to figure out what was going on. It's a very unusual cluster, but there's a similar one. B2 is 1637 plus 29. It was studied in 1988 originally by De Ruder and uh, companions. And one of the things they noticed was that the central cluster, A1 and A2, was two interacting galaxies, but the redshift differential between them was over 4,000 kilometers per second. So they developed a model in which there was a strong gravitational interaction, and the higher redshift unit A2 was just speeding by. Then they did further study a decade later and found out, uh oh, there's two more galaxies that are also 4,000 kilometers per second higher redshift, D and E. And then there's a bunch of others that are the same as A1 and you know, a slightly smaller redshift, and again, about 4,000 small. So now that throws out the original model because you're not just talking about one galaxy that happens to be speeding by, you've got like, two groups of galaxies. And in their conclusion, they stated this this alternative is perhaps not very attractive because the Hubble flow is believed to be reasonably smooth deviations much less than 1,000 kilometers per second, while here we would have to admit a difference of about 4,000 kilometers per second in the same region of space, not a single galaxy with entire groups of galaxies. Um, it reminded me of Bohr's famous quote, how wonderful that we have met with a paradox and we have some hope of making progress. Obviously, when you get a 4,000 kilometers per second discrepancy, this is something that you want to investigate, because you know, your whole mainstream model is based upon everything tightly found in the Hubble law. So I've gone ahead and I've summarized some of that research Actually, everything on the next slide. That's all of it. Oh. <laughs> I'm rich. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> everything they've done to look into this particular system. The point is, they don't, it doesn't interest them. It doesn't fit with their models. They just move out and somebody else worries about it. So then, at the same time, mainstream researchers who claim there are no violations of public law. Mm -hmm. They're having it both ways. They're ignoring some in the literature describe the cases and then claiming that there uh, is no evidence. So when I look at the Tully Christian relation, just to give you a brief uh, summary of what it is, in spiral galaxies, the faster they rotate, the more luminous they are. So this graph shows uh, the plot you get for a calibration of the Tully Fisher relation. On the bottom is the logarithm of the rotational velocity, on the side is the absolute magnitude. These come from Cepheid calibrators, uh, surface brightness fluctuation calibrators. 36 calibrators here to calibrate the relationship and then apply it to multiple other galaxies, uh, several hundred, maybe three, four hundred. At any rate, 
Uh, that's the basic calibration. The only thing I would point to is the scat. Tell pressure relation typically is expected to have about 0 0.3 to 0 0.7 magnitudes of scatter in the distance modulus, which is the term you convert to the megaparsec. <coughs> All right, uh, but if you use strict selection criteria in developing your sample, you can reduce it. And most astronomers don't do that. You just measure every possible galaxy, lump them all in, let the errors of bad galaxies build up the overall average error. And there are actually very clean ways to eliminate some of the errors. Uh, number one, look at the inclination. If they would actually take the time to look at the pictures of the galaxies, they could reduce their scatter. The galaxy on the upper left here, as an inclination recorded in the database that I use of 51 degrees. Well, I look at the picture of the galaxy, you can see it's face on, it's like you're above it. So that's it's certainly under 30 degrees. The point is that would introduce a huge error. And in fact, when I just used the data as it was, I got a huge error in the distance compared to the rest of the galaxies that that uh, galaxy is clustered. Another example going the opposite way. It's an edge on a galaxy, they gave it a 76 degree inclination. So that kind of visual inspection gives you a sanity check on some of your data. Uh, rotation curve, same thing. Oops. Uh, if you look at this rotation curve, that's a nice clean, flat rotate, rotation curve. That's what you want for a galaxy. Some of them are disturbed. Some of them don't seem to reach a peak where they flatten out. So you can introduce additional errors there. One of the big ones they've been researching, and they've known it for a long time, is slow rotators. Uh, what we mean by that is if the galaxy is rotating less than 120 kilometers per second, it doesn't follow the totally fissure relation real tightly. To give you an example, the Pisces supercluster, which was part of my sample, had 95 galaxies in it. When I just took out the slow rotators and calculated their distances, the scatter was 0.89 magnitudes in distance modulus, whereas uh, for the galaxies that met the strict selection criteria, it was only 0.29 magnitudes. So you're getting a large increase in scatter when you accept the smaller galaxies in your sample. Uh, another thing that, again, look at the pictures, look at the distances, use common sense. The galaxy on the left and the galaxy on the right are in the same database, or the same cluster, places cluster, they're in the same data. However, uh, you can see they have similar rotational velocities, which means they're about the same size. They have similar redshifts, so according to Hubble, they should be the same distance. But what we actually see is using the totally fisher relation, the galaxy on the right is over twice the distance. Just look at the picture, a much smaller galaxy. Exactly what you expect in appearance, that is. Exactly what you expect is two galaxies the same size, but the one on the right is actually at a much greater distance. Well, what happens is this galaxy gets incorporated into the cluster sample, again, introducing a large amount of scatter into the total fissure relation because it's actually a background galaxy with a similar redshift to the rest of the cluster. Uh, so, what I did was I figured at least 2,500 kilometers per second is where you need to go to start to get. Uh, some evidence for actual deviations as opposed to peculiar motion. So here's a sample of them. There's many more in the sample, just a handful of them from a Tully Fisher sample that have pretty large deviations. These two galaxies uh, are here, 488, 487, 488-2, have similar redshift, similar distance, and both are around 4,000 kilometers per second off, which you would expect for a smooth Hubble flow, 70, uh, Hubble constant of 70. Uh, I want to take a look at a couple of these examples more closely. So first, ESO 5175, it's in the Hydra cluster. Its redshift is about 1,500, 1,600 kilometers per second more than what's typical for the cluster. But if you look at the picture, it's not a background galaxy. All right, it's a similar, uh, both these first two galaxies on the left are the same cluster. And you can see they have similar rotational velocities, right around 180. Uh, they have pretty similar distances. This one's actually closer despite the higher redshift. And uh, so looking at the appearance, they you see similar resolution and features, uh, similar apparent diameters. These are both the same size image. They're both five arc minutes. Or all the images I'm showing you are five arc minutes of sky, and they're all shrunk to the same scale. Uh, this one's an interesting one because it illustrates part of the graph, uh, the earlier graphs. You have this galaxy at the same distance as 5175, but half the redshift. And yet, you look at the appearance, they're almost like that. So again, the idea is, according to Hubble law, this one should, on the right should be twice as close. But it's not. All right? and so in this case, two galaxies are the same distance, but one has half the redshift of the other. In the earlier slide, two galaxies are the same redshift, one had twice the distance of the other. So these kinds of deviations that exist out there uh, with this. Uh, another example that's interesting for comparison, here we have, again, two galaxies with the same redshift. Again, ESO 5175. This galaxy that I'm comparing with has a much larger red rotational velocity, so it's a bigger galaxy. 
the Hubble law was right in all cases, with no exceptions, this galaxy should have looked bigger than that one. It's not the case. You can see that uh, the galaxy on the right should have a smaller apparent diameter, which is consistent with the fact that the Tully Fisher relation gives it a distance almost twice the distance of the ESO 5075. Uh, this is one of my favorites for looking at this because it's got a really large deviation and there's a lot of evidence to support this particular one. So it's a large deviation model as well. Uh, ESO 44527, pictured up here. Uh, basically, to get to the quick summary of the data, 110 megaparsecs is the distance. Its redshift velocity is 11,654 kilometers per second, leading to a deviation from Hubble law of 3,940 kilometers per second. Almost 4,000, again, it's a huge difference. The data itself in this galaxy is extremely good. Very small error or uncertainty in the rotational velocity, very small uncertainty in its magnitude. Uh, its rotation curve is right here, a nice flat rotation curve. So data-wise, it looks really good. So I did some other comparisons with this one. First, I looked for companions. The idea being, if this galaxy actually is, it has some kind of error, some outlier in the Tully Fisher law, then it should, it should kind of be on its own. But here we have three other galaxies. Similar redshifts, similar distances, all at about 110, 115 megaparsecs. Then if you look at the images, you can see very similar resolution of arm structure. All right, they all look very similar. So in other words, it's not like these galaxies happen to be at the correct Hubble distance. They also show large deviations from Hubble's law. And their spatial angular separation from ESO 44527 puts it within about 10 megaparsecs on the sky. So in other words, we have a region where there's a number of galaxies that show this large 3,000, 4,000 kilometers per second deviation. Uh, another thing, we have an independent supernova distance from a uh, public key project that confirms this. Top galaxy, IC 4232, is at 117 megaparsecs, which is slightly farther. It does have a lower redshift, which is why they accept it in their sample, because that gives them just a small enough deviation that it doesn't blow their brains away. But uh, think about it. But uh, you can see it's uh, very, again, very similar resolution, but it confirms that distance of um, ESO 44527. So we have two different methods. A couple other comparisons, just to show you. Again, this is where if astronomers would look at pictures, it might help them out. All right, uh, we have a sequence of galaxies. Notice the red shifts, or so the rotational velocities are fairly similar. They do actually get a little bit faster rotating as I go to the more distant galaxy, which means it's actually a little bit larger, but not a dramatic difference. Notice all three of these galaxies follow Hubble's law, according to the Tully Fisher distance. So if the Tully Fisher relation works for these three galaxies, then why not for ESO 445.27? According to the Hubble law, it should look more like this galaxy. More distant, look smaller, uh, less resolution of features, which you can see in the angular diameters confirm that this uh, 445.27 has a larger angular diameter, which is consistent with it being closer goes the farther. Uh, it fits right in very neatly next to 527.11. Right? And they're actually at about the same distance. But notice the redshift. Right? 527.11 has a 3,600 kilometers per second smaller redshift, despite being a little bit more distant than 445.27. So these are the kinds of comparisons you can make if you actually look at the pictures. And, and you do that as a sanity check. And I know astronomers don't like to look at the pictures. That's not a rigorous way to approach it, but ask yourself uh, with some of these other examples if it doesn't make sense. There's another one. Uh, 44527 against 3526. This galaxy is about 20 megaparsecs more distant according to the Tully Fisher relation, but its redshift is 7,800 kilometers per second, 3,800 kilometers per second smaller than this one, and yet it's 20 megaparsecs more distant. So, so again, it's indicating some kind of deviation on the order of about. Uh, Three to four thousand kilometers per second in Hubble's law. Uh, one more group to compare with. All right, five hundred nine fifty two is an interesting example because it's actually very close in the sky to four forty five twenty seven. So if you remember the earlier comparison, there were three other companions that were at the same distance. Here we have one that, in terms of redshift, pretty close, and angular separation in the sky is really close, but it actually is background. In the same rotational velocity, the Tully Fisher relation puts it about 40 megaparsecs more distant, which is consistent with a smaller angular diameter. You can see this image compared to that one. Um, so it's a, it's a clear case of the Tully Fisher relation working with the Hubble relation not working. 
finally, to include that, uh, here we have uh, this particular galaxy, 108, 139, has a similar rotational velocity again, about the same redshift again, but it's six, over 60 megaparsecs more distant for an Antilly Fisher release. And again, you can see when you compare the pictures, much higher resolution now of features. Notice the arm structure is much harder than it's at. Uh, clearly a larger angular diameter as you look at it on the left versus the right. All these are consistent with uh, 108, 139, actually being in its Kelly Fisher relation more distant than 445.27. And again, therefore consistent with this galaxy having about 4,000 kilometers per second of excess redshift. So what does this all mean? For those of you who like to theorize about how to explain this kind of stuff, real quickly here, uh, one possibility that I consider, and this goes along with the ARPS thinking is, is that the actual Hubble constant, the cosmological component of redshift, is about 58 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Anything a galaxy exhibits, if you get a good distance to it, that's greater than that, has a non-cosmological origin, intrinsic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and so if that, if that model is accurate, then a few things to think about for those of you who'd like to uh, uh, theorize on ways to explain this stuff. Number one, your theory must be able to account for the existence of the cosmological redshift component. Now, Art thinks he has that with his variable mass hypothesis, but uh, you know, there could be other mechanisms as well. But you've got to be able to explain that portion of the redshift that does increase with distance. And there has to be such a component, otherwise normal galaxies would show that overall trend as much scattered as it does have. So it's got to be a little bit of uh, uh, cosmological component to redshift that increases the distance. Second thing, you've got to be able to explain two galaxies that are at the same distance but have very different redshift values, <laughs> such as NGC 7603, where there's an 8,000 kilometers per second difference. And there's many that have much larger and, and maybe a little bit smaller as well. There's a lot of examples out there. Third, uh, explain a large galaxy having a non cosmological redshift. And the reason I point this out is a lot of mechanisms I've seen proposed about the quasars, because that was our big thing initially. But we're also seeing that it, maybe it can appear across the entire galaxy. So your mechanism ought to be able to account for that as well. And uh, finally, going back to the quasars, you know, mechanisms in addition to all that can explain quasars themselves having a dominant non cosmological component. I think that pretty much finishes up what I have to say. If you have any questions, just step to the microphone. I have a question. Yes. You have to have a photograph of the uh, part of 205. Uh, I do have my later presentation for Dr. Arp. Yeah. Oh, you can show it later? Uh, hopefully. I got it. That might be a little too long for what they want. Well, you can what they did is kind of kill us by turning the, their photograph, the opposition, and showing the thing in a different location. Oh, is that what they did? That's what they did. I don't remember seeing that. Yeah. In, 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 the, uh, in the one from this from Mark's book, the quasar is up here. And in there, uh, uh, it's, uh, right. it's still there, but they, but they turn the photograph and they, they claim that you go down two and a half uh, seconds of arc to get this object that's supposed to be part of 205. They say, actually, I had about 20 different people look at that, and that's the one they picked out thinking it was 205, and 205 was up there. Right. Because they didn't give the actual location. But, well, and the other interesting thing about that example of marking a 205 is, Round based telescopes consistently show that bridge, and so you gotta wonder how the Hubble Space Telescope was used when they couldn't find the bridge. Well, they also said there was no bridge available. They couldn't see the bridge. You could see it if you're looking at the right object, it was right. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, um, have you uh, seen examples of uh, deep space objects that have been shifted? If you are aware of that, what would be a possible explanation? That's an interesting one. Uh, yeah, there are a few examples. Within the Virgo cluster, question is, uh, are there any other questions? Are blue shifted objects. Because in the Virgo cluster, there's a number of galaxies that have blue shifts. And uh, the blue shifts imply, by the way, peculiar motions within that cluster on the order of 1,000, 1,200 kilometers per second. But what's odd about that is the galaxies that have those blue shifts are the really big galaxies in the cluster. Some of the big elliptical, some of the biggest spirals. So the question is if you look at the Virgo cluster redshift distribution, you start to ask yourself why is it the big galaxies have these low redshifts? And then the small galaxies have these higher redshifts. And then also, why is it that the um, spiral galaxies have a very clear distinction based on the type of spiral galaxy? The, the type called SC1s have very high excess redshifts, whereas the SA and SB spirals 
which are kept on tightly wound arms, are very low, small registers. So there are a handful of blue shifted objects, but for the most part, they're in the group of cluster. Thank you. Yep. Sir? Yeah, you mentioned that there were some areas of space that actually is impossible to these function relations. Is anyone actually mapped out space to find out of certain directions? Um, in the early 70s, there, were, there was one attempt, and then that kind of got discredited, uh, where they thought that in one direction there was a big velocity difference versus the other. I think that such an effect might be there. And the reason I say that is I noticed uh, when I was doing my comparisons, the excess redshifts seem to be more in the southern celestial sphere, if you will. You know, like, like the ESO galaxies I was pointing to, most of the examples of the high excess redshifts seem to come from the southern. ESO, European Southern Observatory Survey, whereas the galaxies that tend to have smaller redshifts, maybe don't violate or deviate from the Hubble's laws, which they tend to overall to be more in the northern hemisphere. That's not a universal rule. I've seen in both hemispheres you have both. So it's, it's not a universal thing, but I think there's a tendency there. Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, your work, you see evidence for uh, the quantized effect in the non cosmological redshift? That's an interesting one. I, uh, I worked with, for a bit of time with uh, Morley Bell, a uh, Canadian researcher who thinks that there are quantized redshifts. And uh, he took my sample of my distances and he was able to apply the formula to it. And he was able to show that there seems to be uh, quantized peaks in the redshifts if you have a Hubble constant around 58. For me, the one thing, I, I'm a little cautious about that result because uh, he was using my earlier calibration in the blue light, whereas now I'm using infrared wave bands, which I think are a little more accurate. So I'd like to see that redone with the infrared data. But uh, you know, mainstream just kind of, they don't like quantization, so it's hard to get it published, too. I would like to also have you studied gravitational redshifts. Uh, gravitational redshifts, I've read about them. I have studied it. Um, in a great source, it seems very obvious that they're very strong gravitational redshifts. And always have a mix of gravitational redshift and the distance of the redshift. So that explains many of the variations. Yeah, I think and that may be the case with quasar. I think it's certainly a viable model. I think with galaxies, if, if I understand the gravitational redshifts correctly, when you start talking about structure the size of a galaxy, whereas the quasars are going to be very small and they're local, uh, a, a large galaxy might be hard to explain in that gravitational redshift across the entire disk. At least I haven't seen a model that tried to explain it. Yes. Yes, you would. Yeah, I think you're right. Yes, sir. Okay, on the last uh, question before this one, where you talked about the Southern Observatory. Yes. Showing more red shift or higher red shift. Yes. And did you say why it might be that you're seeing them more from the south than the north? No, yeah, I don't have an explanation for that. That's a good question. I and, and I, it's not. A, I won't even say it's a quantified result. I just noticed as I go through my tables of galaxies that I calculate these distances for, the ones that get the good data. I noticed it seems like the ones that pop up with the excess redshift tend to be southern hemisphere galaxies, whereas the ones that when I did some of my comparisons, a couple of those galaxies I compared against were northern, not all of them, but a lot of times it's very easy to find a northern hemisphere galaxy that has a similar redshift to a southern hemisphere galaxy, but has much greater television distance. So I, I don't know what the reason could, for that would be. I, I have read some, you know, I've seen scans some abstracts to see where some people think that there is a uh, overall movement or rotation of the universe, maybe. I don't guess it was some of that kind of thing. I guess that would make sense if yeah. you should have a lot of distance. Right. I'm very interested to see how it looks all together. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave Russell.